Chicago Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 35. All cars stand by. Federal agents are staking out on John Billinger. That's all. for the motorist who does not feel that his car is performing as well as it should. It may sputter and jerk at starting. It may buck when you step down hard on the accelerator. It may be logy on the hill. Now it is possible that you may need the services of a mechanic. But before you consult him, make this test. Fill your tank with Rio Grande Cracked with tetraethyl, the dependable performance of which is responsible for its demand by police and fire departments. Then put your car through its paces. You may be surprised to find out that the fault has been the gasoline you've been using and not the mechanical condition of your car. Rio Grande Cracked will bring out the best in your car. If it will not perform with Rio Grande Cracked, we suggest that you take it at once to a reputable mechanic. But make the above test first. You may save money and also discover the qualities of Rio Grande Cracked gasoline. This time of year, you should be particularly careful about lubrication. Bearings and other moving parts are expensive, and it requires dependable oil to protect them. Be certain by using either Sinclair Pennsylvania or Sinclair Opaline motor oil. These oils have longer life because they are extra refined. Also, you are guarded against substitution because these famous oils are sold only in patented, extra measure, tamper-proof cans. Drain and fill your crankcase with either Sinclair Pennsylvania or Sinclair Opaline at a cost no more than bulk oil. And now, Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department has a message for you. Good evening, Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. Just four months ago... It was my privilege to bring to you from Tucson, our sister city of the Southwest, a dramatization of the excellent police work of Chief Wallard and his men in capturing the Dillinger gang. On that occasion, I remarked that the next time Dillinger met an officer of the law, that officer might shoot first and talk afterwards. That is exactly what happened in Chicago just 72 hours ago at this time. Tonight, I wish to express not only for myself and my brother officers, but for the people of the Southwest, our admiration and gratitude to the police officers and federal investigators under Melvin Purvis, who Sunday night rid the nation of its public enemy number one. And in this radio recreation of the Dillinger saga, to salute every peace officer who risked his life in the long battle to crush the Dillinger mob. September 26, 1933. Under a hail of machine gun bullets, Charles Makeley, Harry Pierpont, and Russell Clark, accompanied by seven other convicts, successfully escaped from the Indiana State Penitentiary. As the ten desperate criminals disappear into the mists of early morning, all Indiana awakens to a reign of terror. A few days later in Lima, Ohio... You the sheriff? Yeah. You holding John Dillinger here? Yeah. We've come to get him. Who are you? Officers from Michigan City, Indiana. He's wanted there. You'll have to show me your credentials. Here's our credentials! spreads throughout the Middle West. Hysterical fear mounts. Not since the days when Jesse James rode the prairies have respectable citizens lived in mortal dread of ruthless outlaws. Dillinger is loose! Indianapolis, $21,000 taken from the Massachusetts Avenue Bank. 
New Carlisle, Ohio. Bandits take $53,000 from New Carlisle Bank in daring daylight robbery. Carroll, Pennsylvania. Hold up a Sparrow Bank. Lost $24,000. Daleville, Indiana. Hold up and lost $3,500. Mount Pelier, Indiana. $12,000 falls in the Mount Pelier Bank. Racine, Wisconsin. Hold up of the American Bank and Trust Company. Lost $27,000. Greencastle, Indiana. $74,000 bank robbery. Such is the list of crimes attributed to the Dillinger mob in their two and a half months of gun mad freedom when they ride the plains of the Middle West like avenging scourges of evil. Careful traps set for them are lashed away in a hail of bullets from the gangster's guns, which claimed the lives of Police Sergeant W.T. Stanley of Chicago and Indiana State Patrolman Eugene Teague. Outraged public opinion is demanding the lives of these mad messengers of doom when, like a screaming flock of harpies, they descend on East Chicago, Indiana in early January. Each with the latest model submachine gun hooked under his arm, Dillinger, Makely, Pierpont, and Clark burst into the First National Bank of East Chicago. This is a stick-up. Everybody stand still. Now, look here, my good man. Stand still, I said. Clark. Yes, John. Keep these people covered. Right. Charlie and I will go through the tills. I'll take everything in this place in less than three minutes. Come on, Charlie. Oh, look. There's a policeman. Where? Outside. He sees something wrong. He's coming in. Look out, John. Here comes the cop. Where? What's going on in here? Oh! That's what's going on, copper. Why didn't you tell me there was a bull coming in, Harry? I didn't see him. Better keep your eyes open in the future. It's healthier. Got all stuff, John? Yeah, if everything was loose. Let's get out of here. Okay. All right, you folks. Just stay where you are. Unless you want to do the lead poison like this copper's got. With three policemen murders to the mob's credit, federal officers combined forces of local and state police. Roads are blocked. The militia has turned out. Society prepares to do battle against its enemies. But as suddenly as it began, the reign of terror ends. Peace once more descends on the Middle West. The shattered nerves of farmer, merchant, and banker gradually return to normal. Dillinger seems to have disappeared from the face of the earth. A pale desert moon casts its transparent coverlet over the jagged crest of Mount Lemmon. From a sandy wash, a coyote howls at the silent squaw that broods above him, thrusting its spiny arms toward the star-speckled velvet dome overhead. Across this scene of beautiful desolation comes a discordant note, a tinny popular song, played by a three-piece orchestra in a desert roadhouse. The place is a few miles from Tucson, Arizona. It is the night of January 24, 1934. A couple of traveling salesmen at the bar scrape up an acquaintance with a drunken gentleman from Chicago who claims he's a racketeer. The two salesmen, kidding him, claim that they are safe crackers. Taking them at face value, the gentleman from Chicago invites them to go to his house for a drink. Sure, things got a little hot back east, so I came out here with a couple of pals for the tools off. You figuring any stick-ups around here? No, are you? You, you never can tell. You're a damn fool to try it. Uh, why? Say, there are only two roads out of Arizona. And every Indian on the reservation knows the country better than you do. You can never make a getaway. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you're right. Hey, I got some new equipment here. Like to see it? Yeah, sure. Just a minute till I open up this shirt. Say, will you look at that? Yeah. It's the real thing, all right. It is the new super caliber machine gun. Takes a 35.1. Gee, that's, uh, that's quite a weapon, is it? A weapon? I'll say it is. This baby's dynamite. Rip a hole in you big enough to drive a truck through. <sighs> well, uh, I think we better be getting to bed. It's pretty late. What's the hurry? Charlie will be in soon. Uh, uh, who's Charlie? He's my partner. You ought to see him handle a sawed-off shotgun. Uh, no, I, I think we better go to bed. Uh, uh, glad to have met you, pal. Yeah, sure. Oh, well, so long. Uh, so, so long. Well, I'll be a lot of expensive, Harry. That is, Harry. That guy's the real thing. He isn't kidding. You're selling me? Listen, I think we'd better report him to the police. Yeah, but that, that, that's taking a chance. If he isn't somebody they're looking for, he, he might put us on the spot. Yeah, if he is, if he wakes up tomorrow morning and remembers what he told us, he might put us on the spot anyway. Maybe you're right, Harry. Uh, let's report him to the police right now. Uh, 
Chief Waller of the Tucson Police Force recognizes the frightened salesman's description of the loquacious gunman as Clark, a member of the Dillinger Gang, and immediately sends officers Jay Smith and Dallas Ford to stake out his house on 2nd Avenue. After a little wait, a man leaves the house, is arrested, brought into the chief's office and identified as Charlie Makeley. Realizing now for certain that he's on the trail of the Dillinger mob, Chief Waller sends officers Ford, Sherman, and Iman to watch for several hours, parked near the house, and no one appears. Then Sherman resolves on a bold plan and approaches the house. What is it? Does Mr. Clark live here? Yes. Well, I got a special delivery letter for him. Well, give it to me. I'll give oh, it to Oh, I'm you. sorry. I'll have to deliver it to him myself in person. Well, you can't. Don't close that door on me. So get your foot out of there. Open up there. Come on, boy. Who wants this to blow? Keep those other guys out. I'll take care of him. Oh, no, Clark, he's got a gun. Yeah, well, I got it by the hammer. He can't do it. Ram the door, man. Oh, come on. Break the door in. Get out of there. Get in the Didn't know you were making such a big guy, did you, copper? I'll finish you off as soon as I can get over to the bed where I left that gun. Hold him, Jeff. I'm coming now. Oh, you're... Oh. Uh, thanks, Dallas. I, I guess that pistol whipping will keep him quiet for a while. Oh, you killed him. You killed him. Well, I'm afraid not, lady. He's just sleeping for a while. But you nearly took my finger off when you slammed that door on him. Oh, well, we got taken your head off. Oh, now, that's no way to talk, sister. Because it won't do you a bit of good. You're coming along to the station with us just the same. unconscious, is taken to the police station, where his bruises are dressed, and he is identified by Mark Robbins, identification expert of the Tucson Police Department. Shortly afterward, motorcycle patrolman Earl Nolan picks up Pierpont as he's leaving a tourist camp. The stakeout is resumed on the 2nd Avenue house. In the early evening, just as the dusk is deepening into night, a car pulls up across the street from the house and a man gets out. Detective Heron is five steps behind Dillinger when the bandit stops in his tracks at the sight of blood which had fallen on the porch steps when Clark was taken out. Heron steps up to him as Dillinger wheels around, hands in his coat pocket. Put up your hands, Dillinger. What is this? A stick up? No, it's an arrest. Pull him up. I'm pulling the trigger. Arrest? What for? What's the charge? Fugitive from justice will do for the time being. Walker, Mulaney, cover that dame in the car over there. No, you don't, Dillinger. Feel that in your ribs? Now, don't get fancy. I'll let you have it. No, if you don't mind... I'll relieve you of your gun. Hmm. Two of me. One on either side. And now if you'll lower your hand. All right, all right. Come on. Cut out the politeness. Put the braces on. Let's get down to your lousy jail. I won't be there long anyway. There ain't a jail in this country strong enough to hold me. <laughs> By rail and by plane, officials rushed to Tucson from Wisconsin, from Indiana, from Ohio. Each state eager to extradite the men for crimes in their territory. After days of legal complications, Dillinger is spirited away by plane to Crown Point, Indiana, to answer for the murder of the patrolman in the East Chicago holdup. A day later, the other three bandits leave by train for the East to face trial in Lima, Ohio, for the murder of Sheriff Farber. Ohio Justice is swift. Harry Pierpont and Charles Makeley receive mandatory death sentences. And Clark is imprisoned for life for the murder of Sheriff Farber in Lima. But in the Lake County Jail at Crown Point, Indiana, John Dillinger's mind is occupied with other matters than answering to the bar of justice. His strange activities arouse the curiosity of Herbert Youngblood, his Negro cellmate. Uh, Miss, Mr. John, what you all been whittling away at? You know, for a man who has got a murder rap waiting for, you all is the most unconcerned white man that I ever done see. Well, Herb, I'll tell you. If you'll keep it a secret. Sure thing. I, I, I keep the secret good. Well, you're sure better. Sure I will. Now, now, what is it, sir? This thing I'm whittling at is a key to the jailhouse. A key to the jailhouse? Say, what you all talking about? Looks like, like a, like a dumb gun to me. <laughs> They're both right, Herb. 
It's a dumb one, and it's my ticket out of this hick jail. What do you all mean? I mean that after I get this thing whittled with these razor blades, I blacken it with shoe polish, stick the blades on this full chamber, and the guard will think it's a real gat. Yeah, but that's an awful, awful chance for you to take Mr. Young. Better than the chair, ain't it? Well, I suppose it is. I'll only need it until I get the guns in the sheriff's office. Say, Herb, I might want a partner. How about it? You, you, you all mean they won't take me with you? Sure, if you got the guts. Why, sure, I've got the guts, Mr. John. Okay, oh. Herb, now here's the idea. We'll wait until the guard brings us out, John. Well, John, here's a bite of supper for you. Well, that's just swell, Tenji. And now you can stick him up. Wait, what? Shut yeah, up. Don't shoot. Get in here, quick. Grab his gun, Herb. I don't know, Mr. John. Please don't shoot. Okay, turnkey. Now you stay here and keep your trap shut. Come on, Herb. Let's go. Once more, the cry goes up. Still in turn, Goose. But Dillinger eludes the dragnet that extends across four states. Officials declare that Dillinger will be shot on sight if he sticks his head inside Chicago. And the next day, Sheriff Polly's abandoned car is found on the Chicago side street. In the Lime, Ohio jail, Clark, Makeley, and Pierpont sit up all night, awaiting their delivery at the hands of their pal John. Earl Sarber, the murdered sheriff's son, strips them to their underwear, throws floodlights on the jail, and dares Dillinger to come and get his friends. In Fort Huron, Michigan, Herbert Youngblood is fatally wounded in a gun battle with the police. Before he dies, he admits that John has crossed the lake. The trail grows cold. And then in April, a tip comes that Dillinger is hiding out in the apartment of his sweetheart, half-Indian, Evelyn Frechette. Unaware that he's been spotted, Dillinger is enjoying a noontime breakfast with his girlfriend. Oh, John, it's swell to have you here. Yeah. Good to be here, Ev. I'm getting tired of jumping around like this all the time. I'd like to settle down. Draw breath without having to look around for bulls. Oh, I know, honey. It's tough. I don't think they recognize you now you've got your hair dyed red. You look so different. What do you mean, different? Don't you like me this way? Oh, I'd even like you bald, John. <laughs> yeah. Sure, anyway. That's swell. Come on, honey. Give me a kiss. Well, I... Oh, oh babe, you got... Hey, what's that? What? The guy's in the stairs. Wait until I look out the window. The bull. Hey, what is this? What do you mean, John? If I thought you'd spill anything... Oh, I'd... what do you take me for, John? A thing? Okay, but if I ever find out you took oh, me off... Oh, honey, you ought to know better. Okay, okay, now listen. i got to get out of here. You hold him off the front way. I'll take this gun and shoot my way out the back. Goodbye, oh, honey. Oh, goodbye, John. Oh, be careful. Sure. And Dillinger once more eludes the law. His sweetheart, Evelyn Frechette, is arrested and sentenced to two years in prison for harboring a criminal. But Dillinger, wounded, escapes. Joined by John Hamilton, Tom Carroll, and Homer Van Meter, the new Dillinger gang descends on the Warsaw, Indiana police station in a midnight raid that furnishes them with bulletproof vests, guns, and plenty of ammunition. And then they retire to a hideaway on Spider Lake in northern Wisconsin, which Hamilton had already prepared for them. Here they lay their future plans. Say, John, how about those two coppers in East Chicago? What two coppers? O'Brien and Mulvey Hill. The two that was to identify you for that bumper for O'Malley. Oh, yeah. Sort of bad having them run around alive. Yeah. Well, we have to see what we can do about that. I'm going to take care of those smugs. Of that. that? Sounded like a jack. Put out all the lights in the joint. Grab your out and get out of quick. With the lights in the lake resort suddenly off, a confused federal agent who had fired at a car which refused to halt plunge into the underbrush after the fleeing figures of the Dillinger mob. Willis Baum, one of the federal men, trails three of the fugitives to a neighboring house. As he approaches the building, he is met by a burst of machine gun bullets. 
and the life of another peace officer is added to the mounting toll of murder attributed to the Dillinger mob. Attention all cars. Milwaukee police calling all cars. John Dillinger and several companions fought it out with federal officers at Spider Lake tonight and escaped. Thought to be headed toward Milwaukee. That is all. Calling all Cook County Sheriff's cars. Dillinger and several of his gang are reported traveling toward Chicago. Shoot to kill this time, boys. Slippery Dillinger gang evades the law again and leaves only a grisly memento of their passing on the outskirts of East Chicago. When the bullet riddled bodies of Officers O'Brien and Mulvey Hill, the state's star witnesses against Dillinger, are discovered early on the morning of May 24th. This latest Dillinger crime sends Sergeant Martin Zarkovich of the East Chicago Police Force riding furiously into the office of his chief. Yes, Sergeant, what is it? Chief? O'Malley was my partner. Yes, I know that, Sergeant. And O'Brien and Mulvey Hill were two of my best friends. Yes. Now they're all dead, bumped off by Dillinger. So we think. And I'm convinced that he did it, and I want to even things up. What do you propose? I propose to go after Dillinger myself. Hmm. That's a pretty big job, Sergeant. I know it, Chief. But I want you to let me go about it my own way, and I know I can get that guy. All right, Martin. I believe in you. Go to it. <laughs> Sergeant Zarkovich disappears from sight. Becomes an habitué of northern Indiana and Chicago saloon. Keeps an alert ear open everywhere for news of Dillinger. Through the boasting conversation of a drunk who talks too much, Zarkovich learns of a woman who shall here be nameless, who has reason to hate Dillinger as much as he does. He manages to make her acquaintance and finally to gain her confidence. Sure, I hate John. Why shouldn't I hate him? Why, if he hadn't talked Tony into joining up with him, Tony would be alive and in my arms right now. Yeah, but I can't understand. You're seeing John all the time. Sure I am. I see him. I kid him along. And all the time, I'm... I'm wanting to cut his throat. Well, why don't you? Because I... I guess I'm afraid of him. Those eyes of his... Well, they look at me and they seem to tell me that they'll haunt me forever. If I do anything to him... Well, maybe his eyes wouldn't haunt you, but some of his boys might. Oh, I ain't afraid of myself. I don't care what happens to him. Of course, there's another way to do it. Yeah? How? Well, the person that turns him over to the bulls gets 15 grand. What do you think I am, a stupid? No, I didn't say that. I just pointed out that 15 grand side of it. Now, look at it this way. You hate him. You want him out of the way. And if you bump him off, he'll try you for murder. That is, if the boys don't get you first. But if you turn him in, you'll have the protection of the bulls and enough dough to travel for a long time. Yeah, but that'd make me a stupid. Well, you? what of it? That guy ought to be out of the way. Everyone knows that. I'll tell you this. If I knew where he was, I'd turn him in. Well, maybe you're right. Sure, I'm right. And now I'll tell you. You give the dope to me, and I'll see that everything's handled so you'll be protected. <laughs> Department of Justice, Purvis speaking. Hello, Chief. Look, this is hot and it's straight. Dillinger is going to the Biograph Theater on the north side tonight to see Manhattan Melodrama. You're sure of that? Absolutely. He goes there almost every night. Okay, and thanks. Purvis, accompanied by a score of Department of Justice operatives, stake out the Biograph Theater early Sunday evening. Purvis and one of his aides sit in their car a few doors away from the theater. More than an hour passes uneventfully. And then, just before nine o'clock. Hey, Ed. There he is. Where? Walking up to the ticket office. I can't mistake that head. Oh, I see. Now he's turning. Yeah. Mm, that's him, all right. Look, Mel. He's dyed his hair. Yeah, it's black. And he's wearing gold rimmed glasses. But that's him. Can I let him get into the theater? Sure. We won't take any chances. There, he's bought his ticket and he's going in. Keep your eye on the exit, Ed. I'm going to give the boys the final orders. Okay, Chief. That was 
with him, Ackerman. I thought so. Now, you and Mike stick around the doorway of the tavern here and keep your eye glued on that theater. Ryan, you and Kelly watch those exits down the alley. He'll probably be in there a couple of hours, but he might get suspicious and try to get out the back door. And get this straight. No matter what he does, we're taking him tonight. Try to get him alive, but if you can't, get him dead. Two torturous hours are spent by the officers surrounding the theater. Two hours and four minutes. And then the doors of the theater swing wide. And the shirt-sleeved audience throngs out into the sweltering summer night. Dillinger saunters onto the sidewalk. Accompanied, so some reports say, by a young woman clad in red. Purvis closes in behind him. As Dillinger crosses an alley, Purvis waves his hand. Five officers close in. Suspicious. Dillinger reaches for his pocket. John Dillinger died on the way to the hospital. The post-mortem of rumors and sob sister conjecture is now taking place. The king is dead, and already the public are crowning the new king. Already the crown of fame as public enemy number one rests on the head of babyface Nelson, a henchman of Dillinger's. Stripped of all of this dime novel romanticism, of this crime publicity, which is only possible in this publicity-conscious nation of ours, stripped of all of the glamour, John Dillinger was just a hoodlum, a cheap criminal, whose stupidity made him appear a daring outlaw. Melvin Purvis and his men, with the help of the police, did a great job in ridding the country of him. And I am confident that this is only the beginning, that with the splendid cooperation of federal, with state and municipal peace officers, the criminal killer and racketeer will be ground completely out of existence. Thank you, Chief Davis. When you see a fire engine roaring down the street, sirens shrieking, or a police car cruising grimly along the highway... Doesn't it give you a thrill? And doesn't it give you a feeling of security to know that this vigilance is kept up 24 hours per day for no other reason than to protect your life and property and the lives and property of your fellow citizens? For jobs like these, the equipment must be kept in perfect mechanical condition. And no motor is dependable without positive lubrication. Sinclair oils have a national reputation as a dependable lubricant. The Army, with all its trucks, tractors, and passenger cars, depend on Sinclair oil. The Navy annually renew its contract with Sinclair for fine oil for its wide variety of equipment. 150 airlines, airports, and aircraft manufacturers make Sinclair oils their standard. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you may have Sinclair Opaline, a premium motor oil in sealed cans at the low price of 25 cents per quart. The Army and the Navy depend on Sinclair lubrication. Is there a better guide for your judgment? By the way, Rio Grande has prepared for your information a complete list of forthcoming cases to be broadcast on Calling All Cars. Drive into your neighborhood Rio Grande service station tomorrow and ask for the Rio Grande radio log. It's free. Police calling all cars, attention all cars, cancellation broadcast 35. John Dillinger was shot a few minutes ago by federal men, and that's all. Tonight's special broadcast of Calling All Cars was written and produced by William N. Robeson. The orchestra was conducted by Frederick Stock, and the following cast appeared. Mary Tuttle as Evelyn Fachette, Clara Nita Burt as Opal Long, Martha Wentworth as the unnamed woman. Hanley Stafford as Dillinger. Richard Legrand as Clark. Sam Pierce as Sergeant Krakowski. Lindsay McCary as Purvis. Truman Ames as Pierpont and Chief of Police. 
Robert Frazier, Sherman, O'Malley, and the Turnkey. Stuart Wilson as Make the Inheritance. And Charlie Lung as Ford, Youngblood, and Van Meter. Sound effects conceived and executed by Lord Lloyd Creekmore. This is Frederick Lindsley saying good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company.